Okay. So, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this week's edition of Paleo Perks, where we will have uh, Shimindri Thenakon uh, from the Florida Museum of Natural History uh, present about paleoecological implications of non lethal marginal traces in clypastroid echinoids. Uh, but before we get uh, to our talk this week, uh, we'll just go through a quick uh, little round of logistics. So uh, the format of today's seminar is uh, this part, the welcome that I'm doing now, uh, which will be followed uh, by Shimindri's talk, and then a moderated Q&A. Um, and then Shimindri has agreed to stick around uh, for uh, more informal tea time afterwards as well. So during the talk, if you have questions, please send them to the questions that Paleo Parks uh, post um, via the chat. So Paleo Parks values the participation of everyone interested in the paleo sciences. So please remember to abide by our code of conduct uh, that you agreed to, uh, to sign up and get the links uh, during today's seminar. Um, if you found yourself here without having um, agreed to the code of conduct, please head to our website and take a look um, and, you know, just be respectful of everyone. Uh, please also keep yourself muted for the duration of the talk. I don't think you should be able to unmute yourselves, um, but if you are, uh, please remute yourself. Uh, once again, you can ask questions by sending a chat um, in the Zoom chat to the questions at Paleo Park's host, uh, who this week is Pedro. And um, if you have any technical issues um, during the talk, you should also send those uh, to Pedro. So we now have closed captions built into Zoom. You can use the CC button at the bottom of uh, your Zoom options um, or the, the bottom of my screen. I think some people have them at the top, um, but there's a little CC button that you can use uh, to uh, turn those on and off um, as you want. We are also, um, as usual, uh, looking for nominations from other outstanding uh, early career researchers um, to uh, give talks. So if you have someone in mind or want to self-nominate, um, you can uh, do that um, on our website as well. So we'll also drop into the chat right now um, a survey monkey that just uh, helps us get an idea of who is watching um, our, uh, our seminars from week to week. Um, it's uh, uh, optional and anonymous, but encouraged. Um, and the uh, link should show up in the chat window. So uh, as I mentioned, today's speaker is uh, Shimindri Thenakon. And uh, so Shimindri got her bachelor's degree at the University of Peridinia um, and is now uh, at the Florida Natural History Museum at the University of Florida working on her PhD. And so without further ado, uh, Shmindri, if you want to take over the screen share, we can get started with your talk. All right, perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be giving a talk at Paleo Perks today. And thanks everyone for joining. Um, so I will be talking about one of my dissertation research projects, which is on non-lethal marginal traces in clypeasteroid echinoids or sand dollars. This project is a part of the larger NSF-funded Echinoid Associated Traces or EAT project, very appropriately named and catchy, I think. Um, I have also listed my PIs and collaborators in this project on the slide. So before I talk about non-lethal marginal traces in echinoids, I will give a short introduction about myself. I am a PhD candidate in zoology at the Department of Biology and at the Florida Museum of Natural History at the University of Florida. I work at the Invertebrate Paleontology Division at the museum, and I'm interested in morphological patterns and paleoecology of Cenozoic mollusks and sand dollars. So I'm an international student from Sri Lanka. I completed my Bachelor of Science at the University of Peradeniya in Sri Lanka, where I majored in zoology. 
Um, I've included a few photographs of myself from my undergrad days when I got my first research experience and field experience. Um, so the fo photo on the bottom left is from my first paleontology field experience where I met an outcrop in the fossiliferous Miocene deposits of Northwestern Sri Lanka. And that's where I got started with my paleo journey. So I'll start my talk with a brief overview of predation in the fossil record. Um, predatory traces such as drill holes, repair scars, and bite marks preserve in the fossils of prey animals. And these are used to study predator-prey interactions in the fossil record. The figure here shows the number of occurrences of predation in the marine fossil record throughout the past 800 million years for all prey and common prey groups. The number of occurrences show an increase for most prey groups during the Cenozoic era or the past 65 million years. Um, occurrences of predation are observed in many prey groups. However, it is extremely abundant in mollusks compared to other phyla. As you can see, the range of values in the y-axis representing numbers of occurrences of the top two panels, which represent all prey and mollusks are much greater than those in the panels below. If you just look at the bars, the differences are not so obvious with the mollusks and the other groups. But if you look at the numbers in the y-axis, then that is very clear that there's a huge difference. So the figure on this slide represents prey occurrences in the marine fossil record, which is split by A types of predation evidence, B prey and C inferred predators. And it is clear that certain types of predatory traces, prey and predators are underrepresented or underutilized in these studies. While some traces and animal groups are more prominent, uh, so, for example, over 75% of all data here represents records of mollusks, drilling mollusks, while prey groups such as echinoderms, which includes echinoids, are underrepresented and point to major gaps in our current knowledge of prey-to-prey -prey interactions in the fossil record. Uh, and some predatory traces, including bite marks, are also understudied in the fossil record. So echinoids, which includes sea urchins, sand dollars, and their relatives, is an underutilized prey group with a good fossil record. While traces of drilling predation are actually quite common in fossil echinoids, even those are understudied compared to the drill holes found in mollusks. Uh, and the drill holes, which are made as a result of predation by cassid gastropods, commonly called helmet snails or bonnet snails, are one of the most commonly identified traces of predation observed in modern echinoids and fossil echinoid tests. So the top right figure here shows how a cassid drill hole looks like on Leodea sexis perforata, a small sand dollar collected from the present day seafloor in the Bahamas. And the fossil echinoid example here is a Mycene age specimen of Echinocymus delatus with a drill hole in its test. So in addition to cassids, there are various types of predators and parasites which feed on echinoids. And some of these predators and parasites also leave behind distinct traces on the tests of echinoids. Um, for example, the small snail in the top left corner, which is a ulimid, are parasitic snails which leave behind small drill holes, typically with a distinct dissolution halo on the echinoid test. The fossil echinoid with uh, ulimid drill holes in the bottom left corner is Echinochoris conica from the late Cretaceous of Germany. And you can see that those drill holes preserve pretty well in the fossils. Um, so several species of fish, including both cartilaginous and bony fish, leave behind bite marks on echinoid tests. Uh, stingrays have been observed feeding on both sand dollars and sea biscuit, biscuits. And this is an example from the Bahamas. So you see the stingray and then the um, damage that, is, that it caused in the figure titled E. And then um, also great trigger fish is a predator which has been observed to cause damage to clypeasteroid echinoid specimens in the Gulf of Mexico. And successful attacks are often lethal to the sand dollar. As you can see here, the tests are pretty badly damaged. 
So non-lethal or sublethal marginal traces are sometimes observed on present day sand dollars uh, too, which are most likely produced by partial predation of crustaceans, including spiny lobsters, several species of crabs, such as sheep crab, blue crab, and also some species of benthic fish. Um, so both lethal or non-lethal test damage in clypeasteroid echinoids can also be a result of mechanical damage due to hydrodynamics, such as wave action. However, the non-lethal traces on live collected clypeasteroid specimens appear to be of biological origin because of non-random species selectivity and site selectivity that is seen on the tests. So traces resembling non-lethal predatory traces are also seen in the fossil record. Preliminary surveys suggested that these traces are widespread and abundant in the fossil record, thus providing an exciting new avenue for predation studies in the fossil record. Clypeasteroid echinoids have robust tests and are capable of surviving multiple and repeated attacks by predators, excuse me. Um, regeneration and wound healing in echinoids help the robustness of the tests and in specimens with non-lethal damages limited to the ambitus or the outer edge, um, the structural integrity of the test would still be preserved, thereby preserving commonly in the fossil record. So image B is a specimen of Parascutella hobarthi, a fossil sand dollar with a healed trace on its test which is pointed to by the arrow. And the specimen in the top right corner is Encopy aberrans from the Pliocene Intracoastal Formation of Northwestern Florida. And the specimen below that is a Pliocene aged Clypeaster sunny landensis from the Tamiami Formation in Florida. So we anticipate that the characteristics of marginal traces on the fossil echinoid specimens are not significantly different from those observed in recent echinoids. So the image here shows marginal traces in live collected recent sand dollars and congeneric fossil specimens with traces. Uh, this study is based on scuba sampled live collected sand dollars with non-lethal traces in the Gulf of Mexico and surveys of fossil species available in the invertebrate paleontology collection at the Florida Museum of Natural History, where I work. So moving on to the methods of the live collected echinoid sampling. So the live sand dollar specimens were collected by scuba from 27 sampling sites on the shallow shelf of the Eastern Gulf of Mexico off Steenhatchee, Florida, uh, during sampling trips from 2017 to 2019. Um, so there were multiple sampling trips. All study sites are located west and southwest of Steenhatchee, um, and they're located on a gently sloping sandy shelf dominated by biogenic carbonate sediments derived from corals, mollusks, and other calcareous organisms. Um, this region also has lowered salinity due to freshwater input by multiple small rivers, which empty into this part of the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the depths at the sites range from 2 to 17 meters. Individual echinoid specimens were hand collected from the seafloor and immediately inserted into sealable plastic bags. All specimens were soaked in alcohol, dried, and stored permanently in the Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, all echinoid specimens were morphologically identified to species level, um, maximum test length, width, depth, and ambitus thickness at anterior and posterior ends were measured with the vernier caliper or a measuring tape. So the specimens were photographed from their oral side and the boral side photographs of the live collected specimens with the aboral side facing upwards were mostly used to assess test margins for traces. And the presence or the absence of marginal traces on each specimen was recorded. In addition, the number of traces on each specimen, the location of traces on the test, where the test was divided into five sectors so that the anterior and posterior regions could be identified on the test, uh, and then the length, the depth of the traces, um, whether the traces involve the lineals, which are the slit-like structures that are found in echinoid tests commonly, or the petals, 
which are the grooves forming somewhat of a flower-like structure with tube feed in them, tube feed in them for respiration. Um, so all of those were recorded uh, in the data set. So this, uh, and finally, the surface area of some specimens, a total of 155 specimens was measured. And for specimens with the tracers, the surface area of the complete test and the area of the tracers were ex extrapolated using Photoshop. So we examined um, 1,181 live collected sand dollar specimens from the Gulf of Mexico to determine diagnostic characteristics, which can be used to identify bite marks in both recent and fossil sand dollars. So this table here shows that the frequency of bites was higher in the thin edge species, such as Encopi aberrans, Encopi michelini, and Melita tenues, compared to the thick edged Clypeaster subdepressus. Uh, only a few specimens uh, of Clypeaster subdepressus contained more than one lethal trace, um, one, non, one non lethal trace. In contrast, many specimens of Encopi and Melita bear multiple traces, with some specimens possessing as many as seven heel traces. Uh, the presence of multiple bites on individual specimens suggests that they can survive multiple attacks. Um, the diagnostic characteristics that were identified using the live collected specimens were, the traces are cuspate in shape, healed and located along the ambitus of the test. The specimens shown here are two specimens which have non-lethal traces on them. And the one on the left side is of the screen is an Encope Michelini, and the one on the right is Melita Aclinensis. Um, so traces are more frequently observed on thin edge sand dollar species, such as Encope and Melita, when compared to thick edged ones. Um, Clypeastus subdepressus is an example of a species that has a notably thick edged ambitus or margin, as you can see here. Um, there's a view of um, the sand dollar, which helps you to compare the thickness of the ambitus with the clypeaster and the thinner melita. Um, so the specimen on the left is, of course, melita, melita and which is a thin edge specimen. Um, traces are most commonly observed in the posterior region of the echinoid test. They, there are notably more specimens with traces on the posterior region when compared to the anterior regions of specimens, and this was observed across all genera. The traces rarely extend into the petals of the test, suggesting that traces or bites involving petals could be lethal, and they are not identified as heel traces on live collected specimens. Um, and this might be because um, many of the vital organs or the systems are concentrated towards the center of the specimen in the petal area. Um, so this bivariate plot shows the relationship between test size and the proportion of injured specimens. Um, on this graph, the x-axis represents the average test length in millimeters, and the y-axis represents the proportion of injured specimens. The points are color-coded based on the species they represent, and each point is a monospecific population sampled from a single site. And only sites with at least 20 specimens belonging to a particular species are included in this analysis. The site numbers are found in the center of the points, and the lines represent 95% um, binomial confidence intervals. Um, we would expect that larger sand dollar specimens are older, which would potentially make them subjected to more attacks with time. So we would expect to see more traces on larger specimens. However, this trend is only seen in Melita tenues, where the larger specimens have more traces compared to the smaller ones but we do not see this trend in any of the other species. 
Um, this bivariate plot depicts variation in the proportion of injured specimens across individual sites. Again, the points represent monospecific populations at sites with at least 20 specimens belonging to a particular species. <coughs> Excuse me. And the points are color coded based on the species. Um, it is interesting to note um, that at sites where there are two species present, there is a higher proportion of traces in the flatter sand dollars compared to the thicker sand dollars, which are the clypeasters. The frequency of bites can vary across sites. However, it varies more across species than across the sites. For example, at site six, there are two species present, which are Clypeaster subdepressus and Melita tenuis. Um, and Melita has a higher proportion of injured specimens than Clypeaster, which reinforces the notion that heel traces are less frequent in species with a thicker ambitus. So according to this figure, there is no clear relationship between water depth and intensity of non-lethal marginal predatory attacks, which indicates that the predatory attacks are not de depth dependent. Um, so Clypeaster is found in a greater depth gradient than any of the other species. However, um, as you can see on this plot, there is no relationship with the presence of the non-lethal traces and the depth observed for Clypeaster. So when looking at the trace area as a fraction of the surface area of the complete test, which was extrapolated using Photoshop, traces rarely extend more than 5% of the surface area of the entire test. And this is not the entire data set. I only did this for 155 specimens, but they do represent all the species that we looked at. And so you can see most of the traces are pretty small, but there are a few that do reach up to about 10% of the entire test area. So growth deformities are sometimes seen in Clypeasteroid echinoids, such as the specimen of Melita tenuis on the left side of this slide. Um, Clypeasteroids have a bilaterally symmetrical test composed of 10 double columns of plates, and the plates grow as the sand dollars grow in size. Um, so these plates have growth bands as seen as in the image on the right, um, and the growth bands increase in number as the specimens age. Um, so if the test is damaged, these plates would also get damaged and we would expect to see damage to the growth bands as well. They would either discontinue or break at the damage site. However, if a specimen has a growth deformity, we would not expect to see the damages to the plates. Um, and we would expect to see the growth bands to be continuous, even though if they might be compressed or uneven in their thickness. And this is a structure which helps us to identify whether the traces were actually predatory traces or a growth deformity. So even though we anticipate that these traces are of predatory origin, as I said, we wanted to see whether the traces could be a result of a growth deformity instead of damage to the test. Um, therefore, we decided to look at the plates and growth bands of specimens with traces. Um, so even though the plates can be seen in um, the echinoid specimen, especially once the spines and the skin is removed. Um, we did use some of the specimens um, where specimens belonging to all four species were bleached using commercial bleach and denuded um, to observe the nature of the test damage. And then we use some imaging techniques. Um, so as a first step, um, what I did was I X-ray imaged the specimens at the CA Pound Laboratory at the University of Florida, which is a forensic anthropology lab, uh, using a Faxitron cabinet X-ray system. Uh, so even though the plates are visible in the X-ray images, the growth bands are not. Um, However, the canals inside 
inside the specimens are visible in the images. And when I was tracing the canals, they do appear to break at the site of damage, suggesting that this is most likely test damage and not a growth deformity. Um, so the canals are visible in this clypeaster specimen as well. However, as you can see in this image, the nature of the plate damage is unclear because the plates um, are not very visible and definitely the growth bands are not visible at all. Therefore, we decided to CT scan some specimens to try and observe um, the plate damage better. So this is a reconstructed nano CT image of the previous Kypiaster specimen viewed on the software VG Studio. So I um, picked out several um, live collected sand dollar specimens, um, which were already bleached and denuded. And then um, uh, using the nano CT scanner at the nanoscale research facility at, at our university, um, I CT scanned them. So I'm still scanning specimens and currently processing the images. So there will be more um, soon. So the plates are visible in this image, as you can see here, and the growth bands become visible when moving through the planes in the 3D image. However, the resolution is relatively low, but it does appear that the plates are broken at the site of damage, and the growth bands appear to also be discontinuous and broken off. However, um, I will be continuing to scan several more specimens with varying extent of damage um, and those belonging to all the different species to observe the growth band damage, um, which is seen on the plates to better understand the nature of the damage. So fossil sand dollars in the invertebrate paleontology collections at the Florida Museum of Natural History were also examined for marginal traces resembling those observed in the live collected specimens. The fossil species include Clypeastosani landensis, Encopitamiamensis, and Melita eclinensis from the Pliocene portion of the Tamiami formation, Ebitella carsoni from the late Oligocene of the Arcadia Formation, Waitala Eldridgei from the early Oligocene of the Bump Nose Limestone, and finally Clypeaster Rogersi from the early Oligocene of Florida. This is from the systematic collection. So fossil echinoid tests were screened for similar morphological traces as those seen in the live collected specimens, and they were interpreted as non-lethal pretori traces if they match the morphological characteristics of the modern traces. Um, and according to the protocol utilized for screening live collected specimens, the presence or the absence of the marginal traces on each specimen was recorded. In addition, the number of traces on the specimen, the location of the traces on the test, the length and the depth of the traces, and whether the traces involved the lineals or the petals was also recorded. Maximum test length, width, depth, and ambitious thickness at the anterior and posterior ends were measured with a vernier caliper. In the fossil specimens, if any trace had broken or fractured margins, they were not identified as non-lethal traces. All traces, um, all test damage identified as non-lethal traces were healed, those with a smooth, smooth edge. So older fossil specimens appear to have fewer traces compared to the younger fossils, and this might suggest that the predators were less common or utilized different predation strategies or maybe preferred different prey species. However, these are preliminary results, but the data does suggest intriguing temporal trends and demonstrate that the bite marks or the traces may be an important source of data on the evolutionary history of sublethal predation. So the traces observed in the fossil specimens are comparable to traces on live collected specimens. They are cuspate in shape and the healed marginal traces are restricted to the outer part of the ambitus and they never extend into the petals. The species specific trace frequencies are comparable to the non-lethal traces which are observed in the live collected echinoids and the traces are more frequently observed in the thin-edged sand dollar species when compared to the thick-edged ones. 
So we, we also see fewer number of traces per specimen um, in the fossil specimens when compared to the live collected specimens. And the bar plot here shows the number of traces in each fossil genera, including specimens with no traces in them. Similarly, when compared with the live collected specimens, there are more specimens with traces on the posterior region of the sand dollar test when compared to the anterior region. And this was seen in all um, genera and species observed. Um, so moving on to the um, final part of the presentation. So these results do suggest that characteristics of non-lethal predation traces can be recognized in fossil specimens using observations from present day echinoid populations of close living relatives. Um, and the fossil record of non-lethal predation is not well explored. And these diagnostic attributes can be used to develop a comprehensive study to figure out how sublethal predation varies in the fossil record. Um, I'm grateful to my advisor um, uh, and the members of the Invertebrate Paleontology Division at the Florida Museum of Natural History and to all my collaborators in this project. Also a big shout out to my undergraduate intern, Kelsey, who I have been mentoring and training while carrying out this project. And she has been amazing to work with. Um, thank you so much. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Thanks. That was really fun. Uh, we already have a couple of questions in, so I'll just uh, get right to it. Um, so Roy Plotnick asked, uh, what about bird predation? And I have seen uh, dead sea urchins that have been killed by gulls. Also, regular echinoids also predate on sand dollars. Any evidence of that? Yes, so birds are, and several other vertebrates, including reptiles, such as turtles, um, those are also predators of um, sand dollars, like clypeastroid echinoids, and also other echinoids as well. Um, however, when we look into the damage, similar to the fish predatory traces that I showed earlier, they tend to be pretty destructive, and the test does get destroyed. Um, so it so it would I typically not leave a non-lethal marginal trace on the specimen, but they are definitely predators of uh, echinoids. I always wonder, like they're very like when thinking about the amount of nutrition that you can get from a sand dollar versus a regular urchin, which is of course like much more, um, it has more tissue. So, but then yeah, like it's interesting how predators do like to eat these. Um, and what was the second question again? The second part of the uh, I put it into the chat, but it says oh, okay. uh, regular echinoids also predate on sand dollars. Any evidence of that? Right. So um, the regular sand dollars, um, I have not observed uh, any pre preying on the pipe asteroids. But then with the regular sand dollars, if it's about non-lethal traces, then usually um, because of the structure of the test, even if a marginal trace was like, even if, if a predator bit into the regular echinoid test, it would actually be very damaging and it would most likely be a lethal attack. So we have another question from Morrison Nolan that says, for echinoids in general, what is the ratio of total body mass to edible flesh uh, uh, for their predators? Um, so for regular echinoid, it would be much higher because of the surface area to volume ratio where the volume is a lot lower than the surface area. But when thinking about a sand dollar, especially one of the flatter ones, that ratio is very low. Um, so for some of the thicker sand dollars or that we commonly call sea biscuits, they of course have significantly more tissue in them, but um, the, the sand dollars, especially the thin ones, the clypeasteroids, yeah, not so much. <laughs> so we have another question that asks, 
uh, how do you differentiate between trace predation and just taphonomic processes that chip away at the edges of the shells? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So um, when looking at the fossil specimens, um, if there was, so when looking at the trace, um, if the test appeared to be broken off, um, or fractured, then I never counted those as um, non-lethal traces. All of the ones in the fossils um, I identified as the marginal traces were healed. So they would have a smooth edge and I would see the tubercles um, uh, which give out this, which, from which the spines emerge. So I would see the tubercles in the edges as well. So they were all smooth and healed. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, let's see, so our um, next question says, Clive Astor seems to have the lowest percentage of non-lethal traces throughout your study. Do you think that this is more a function of its test shape and or habit, habitat, uh, that it is more uh, in its morphology protected, or do they just have higher mortality with test damage or something else? I'll put that one in the chat too, it's a little bit longer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no um, yeah so, so that's a good question because one of the significant differences between um, the Clypeaster test morphology uh, when compared to the thinner sand dollars such as Encopi and Melita would be that the ambitus is definitely thicker. And also the overall, um, the test is actually pretty big and thicker. Um, so I think it makes it a little difficult for certain predators to actually um, uh, prey on it. Um, so I think it's mostly because of the test morphology, but I need to look into it a little bit more to see if there is something else going on because they're all found in the similar in similar habitats. Like they don't burrow deeper into the sand. They're, they're all like pretty like under a shallow um, layer of sand. So, or just like exposed at times. So I think it's mostly to do with the test morphology and the preference of the predator versus the um, uh, habitat. And then it looks like we've got one more so far. So a reminder, if you have questions, please send them uh, to the questions uh, Pilly Park's host, who is Pedro. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, this one says, why do you think that older specimens had more traces uh, in one species, but not the others? Do the relative thicknesses change differently as the different species grow? Um, so, yes. So not usually the thicknesses, well, they, they do change, but it is proportionate to the size of the specimen so that the shape is maintained throughout its um, growth. Um, it was interesting where we saw um, more traces in larger specimens of just the Melita tenues, but not in the others. Um, and not really sure what's going on with that because encopies are, when just thinking about the thickness, the encopies are slightly thicker than the Melitas, but not so much. So we would, I mean, we would expect to see the similar patterns, but strangely not. Maybe with more specimens, we could come up with a better pattern, but right now it's, mm, I'm not too sure. <laughs> All right. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so if that's the case, I will go ahead and take back the screen share. So thank you everyone for joining us. We'll put the SurveyMonkey link uh, back in the chat um, in case you haven't had a chance to fill that out yet. And please come back next week uh, to hear Matthias Senesel uh, from Durham University in the UK to uh, talk, who will talk to us about the Cyclostratigraphy Intercomparison Project, CIP, and the cyclostratigraphy.org website. Uh, so, but uh, don't leave yet. So as I mentioned before, Shmanji has agreed to stay for a tea time. Um, so please uh, join us there um, where you can learn a little bit more about her and her research path. 
um, and what she's doing uh, with her sand dollars. And uh, as well as, you know, meet anyone else who decides to stay, um, make new friends or uh, just generally uh, relax a little bit before you get back to um, your regularly scheduled uh, day. So we'll set this little timer so you can get uh, have a quick two minute break um, and get a drink of water or what have you. Um, and then uh, we'll be back in two minutes um, for tea time. So thanks everyone and we'll see you in a bit. <laughs> 